Good afternoon and welcome back to my sewing room quilty friends and today we are going to be um, starting off the Bee Vintage Sew Along. See right here it starts July 10th and it starts on my blog on July 10th but um, I always do one video right at the very beginning showing you how to do one block from the quilt just so that you know I can show you hands-on how I do my method of my so simple shapes. So here's the quilt right here. It's called the Bee Vintage Sampler Quilt. It has 20 different um, 10 inch finished applique blocks using my um, Bee Vintage So Simple Shapes. And they are all vintage style, things that my grandma and her sisters, you know, applique or would have applique and did applique when I was a girl um, for people in the town, you know, for weddings, babies, um, all different kinds of occasions. And I've always loved those applique quilts and wanted to do an applique quilt with very simple blocks reminiscent of those times that um, many of us received quilts from our grandmothers out of many of these blocks. And so that's what this is. And so block one, or the first block, I don't really know if it's block one, but it's uh, for week one is called the Vintage Strawberry. And it's a very simple block. And I'm just going to show you first how I do this with the shapes and everything. And then we'll go over to the work table. I'll show you how I lay, out, lay it out. And then I'll talk to you more about the sew along and more specifics about that. And so what I have here is I just pulled in the shapes for just this block okay so we've got p2 right here and that's the strawberry we've got p11 which is the top piece right here and then we've got p14 which is the daisy and then we've got p32 which is the stem you can see that it kind of goes down underneath and we use this shape for several of the blocks as well as well as some of the circles too. And this is P64, which is the center of the daisy. So I just wanted to show you those shapes on my blog, which like I say, the sew along takes place on my blog. I do, you know, call out and list the shapes that happen in each block. But just because we're talking about strawberry, I wanted to show them to you. I also wanted to show you how I trace onto my sewing interfacing. Um, I simply just take the shape, grab a pencil, grab the size of interfacing, which is all in the sew along guide, which I guess I should show you now. I mean, if you're if you're um, joining this sew along, you already know by now that I have done my be prepared, be prepared post on my blog, and I do that about a month ahead of time, and I give you the link to the sew along guide, which is not a pattern, but what it is is I've got these pages out of order because I've been using it. But it has notes, but it has the cutting for every piece of fabric that goes into this quilt. And it gives you the schedule. So see, July 10th, it tells you vintage strawberry, and then we'll be going through. And I'll, like I say, I'll talk about that schedule later. But I, I go through my blog post. I show you pictures of all the notions, talk about everything that's happening for this quilt. And so that you can have it detailed. And of course, my YouTube channel and my blog, I work together with them, meaning I link to my blog from my YouTube channel and I link from my blog to my YouTube channel. So you can visually see things and then you can read about um, things, each step-by-step -step tutorial on my blog for the rest of the blogs. And they're not really meant to copy off of my blog, but you could if you wanted to. But um, there's notes in the Sew Along Guide, so you can just jot down certain notes. But these are very simple, straightforward blocks. And, um, you know, so I, don't, I can't see you needing a lot of notes. But that note page is there for you for that. And I just wanted to let you know, make sure that you look at the description in this video, meaning the drop-down menu, and so that you can, you know, click right onto my blog. Okay, back to tracing. And so I've got my sewing interfacing here, and it's a square that's cut the same size of the fabric, and I've already traced this, but I just pulled this in to show you. I just take a mechanical pencil because it doesn't have a wide, you know, like a super wide lead that's going to, as you trace it around, get wider and wider. 
I like to keep a nice thin line and I simply just hold down the template and I just trace it on. And then that becomes my sewing line right there. Now, if you can't see that, I can see that fine. But if you're a person who can't see that, then you can use something darker if you want, because we're just simply going to place it on here and sew directly onto that trace line, and then we'll turn it. And so you won't be able to see that trace line. And so you could use something darker if you wanted. I don't think I'd use a ball point pen or anything, but um, I've never used friction before, but I know a lot of people do. But you could also just trace around it several times to get that darker line if you wanted. Okay, so that's what I did with all of these pieces. I just traced the shape on. The fabric, again, is cut the same. And this is my sewing interfacing that I detail in the blog and show you about. And then we just hold it on here. You can pin if you'd like to. These are small enough. I may pin the strawberry because it's larger. But I just go ahead and sew. And what I do is on my featherweight, I know y'all don't sew on a featherweight, but I'm just showing you that I take a smaller stitch. And so what I would do is just pull it up here. And let's see how small that is. And I just start sewing right into the line. And that's pretty small. Now, when I first started this method, I told you not to sew super small because it kind of gathered up the interfacing. But I have since developed... Um, that was a dinner, different interfacing that I started out with, and I have since developed this interfacing that works better with my shapes, um, you know, several years ago. And I find that you can use a smaller one, see, and it doesn't gather up. So you might as well just go ahead and use a small one. That just means you have more stitches, um, you know, for less things to come undone. So I'm going to grab my readers here, and I like to see up close and personal. I do get a little bit farther away you know, when I'm filming, just because I don't want my uh, my hair to get in the way and you can't see what I'm doing, but I simply just sew on the line, and I always have my hand here, and I just kind of lift up real quick and pivot when it's time, you know, to turn that. Now, I, I do like to sew with any kind of a foot that is open right here so that I can directly see my needle going into my interfacing or onto my trace line because I just feel like what is the point of, you know, tracing an exact shape and then just guessing that you're sewing on it because you can't see. So put some kind of a foot on your machine, like an open toe foot. This happens to be just the original foot that comes with the featherweight um, originally that was kind of standard and that's what I always like to use. And, you know, you don't have to use a featherweight. This is what I usually use for piecing. And so I'm just going to sew around this flower. Now I had my little bonus quilt going here, so I'm just going to clip that off. And then I'm going to finish sewing around the shapes, but I'll put you on, uh, I'll kind of do it in fast motion. I'll have cast speed me up here so you don't have to you know, see all of that um, in real time. But I do want you to see, you know, how I go around each shape. So when I started, I didn't back stitch or anything. I just sewed in or went right on the line. And now I'm over sewing about a half inch or an inch past where I started. And that's all I need to do to lock those stitches in. I'm gonna do one more thing before I have cast speed up and that is with circles. Now, a lot of times with circles, because when you're shaping them, you may poke a hole out. I've learned um, to give the advice that you can sew around it twice if you want. So this is how I sew my circles. I just go around it twice. Because it only takes a few more minutes or seconds actually for each shape that you did want to sew around twice and just a little bit more thread, but that just makes that seem stronger. If that's something that's very curvy and that you're worried about, you know, that's just a little bit of extra insurance that you could do if you wanted to. And I just, I just turn it very smoothly. I go to slow speed. I watch what I do and I slow down at the curves and I go faster, you know, when it's straight and I just feed them in one right after the other and clip apart as needed. 
So this one, because it's almost straight line, see, I can go much faster. And it's easy to see what I'm doing. Okay, I'm just going to continue sewing these, and then we'll talk about the next step. Okay, so now I've got my last piece here to trim up. And all I do really is trim a little bit smaller than a quarter inch. You can go quarter inch if you want. And I just go ahead and when I get to the, the points right there, the tip, you can go in a little bit if you want. Oh, I just realized something. Look, there's one little teeny section that I didn't sew. Remedy that. I guess I had started it in another area that I thought I did. So when you saw me in the camera <laughs> pulling up my squares, that's what I was doing. This is my bonus sewing for a project that I have going in my um, Sew Your Stash series that I'll be showing you again and just in between pieces. I'm sewing one and a half inch squares together, one background and one print. And so that's what I like to do in between to save thread and time and just get some extra bonus sewing done. Okay, now I can go ahead and trim that because that definitely would not have worked when I turned, turned the shape. I have about an inch not sewn. So again, when I get to these tips right here you can cut into it a little bit deeper but not into the tip and I don't really find that real necessary but I do get that question a lot you know can you cut those tips off okay so and then I want to make sure that I've got everything I need here and then we're going to talk about turning them now, when, when I go to turn them, these are fine. These two pieces, I don't have to clip any of the seam allowances. I've already trimmed it, but because they're outer curves, that's it's going to lie flat. It's going to tuck with inside itself once it's turned. But anything with an inner curve like this, you just need to... This is a very gradual one, but you can see that I just clip right to the stitching, but not into the stitching just probably about that far away and I just do one clip. Okay, so that's gonna be good for that. And that's an inner curve. That's why I picked this strawberry. I like to do a simple block in the very beginning that shows kind of cleavage areas like this and inner curves so that you can see, you know, how I, how I go about that. Now this is going to be one clip right to the thread, which is very scary, but I have my readers on and I can see and I use these nice pointy scissors and they're sharp. These are, um, my scissors is gonna be coming out here shortly in three colors. And But anyway, I really like these for this method right here. I like to use larger ones to trim the seam allowance and then just one clip right there. Now, 
it's very scary to clip close to there because you don't want to clip into it, into the thread. So you just have to be able to see what you're doing. And if you clip too far away from the thread, it still won't lie flat. You'll have little creases in there. And, you know, sometimes we can work those out, but try to get as close as you can to the thread. If you happen to make a mistake and clip into the thread and you can see that you clipped into the thread before you turn it, simply um, throw it under the machine again and just go over it, you know, a little bit deeper several times there and you'll fix that. Okay. And now this one right here, I've got one area to clip a cleavage. This one. And sometimes if you've clipped into it and you don't realize until after you've turned it, you can simply just turn it back to right sides together again and, and re-sew. If, unless, you know, if you, if you really, that's one way to do it so you don't have to cut new fabric and things like that. But sometimes you may just have to cut a new piece of fabric. But, and I've had to do that now and then, but most of the time you can salvage it. Okay, so everything else is an outer curve except for right here. And right here so I'm just gonna do a couple of clips right there now I didn't do a great job on sewing there's a crooked line right there but I think it's gonna be just fine when I shape it okay so that's what I do then I take my seam ripper especially on smaller pieces like this and I will just kind of go in sideways making sure that I'm not going into the fabric I can feel that and I'll just make a little slash into the interfacing only like that and then I can grab scissors and the way I would clip this one is probably like that one right there and one right there most of the time I just do like a X or a T but because we want to be able to get into these points you don't want to go clear into them but you want to be able to get into them maybe a little bit deeper okay so you can clip like that if you want when you have larger pieces you, you could simply just pull the fabrics apart if you wanted to and just make one clip like that. And this is where I typically just do an X. I don't need to go clear to the edges. I don't like to, you know, I like to stay away from the seam allowance as much as I can. And on larger pieces I can, all I need is a big enough piece like this that I can just turn, right? Now, when you get small pieces, that may be hard for you to turn. I have not needed to use these yet, but I have these um, by my machine just so I can show you, but these are uh, hemostats or whatever, but and you, they just grab and lock, and you can use those to turn pieces if you'd like. And I hear a lot of people, you know, say that that is helpful to them. Okay, let me grab my clover point to point turner here, and this is what I do. All right, so I'm going to show you how I shape this strawberry because it's bigger and you can see it. And then I'm just going to go ahead and shape the others and, you know, speed it up just a little bit. But this is my rule of what I do that 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 is my rule that works for me. That doesn't mean it works for you, um, but it's my rule that works for me. So that's all I can do is show you what I do. And I have the interfacing facing towards me, the fabric out, and I have the tip of this behind the seam allowance. I guess, I don't know, how can I show that? It's So here's the seam allowance. It's, it's behind here, so the seam allowance is folded over, and so is that. So all I'm doing actually is pushing very gently on the fabric. I'm not pushing on the seam allowance. I'm not pushing... On the interfacing, I'm just very gently, very gently. I know you can't tell how soft I'm doing it, you know, but it is pretty soft. It's got a tip that all you have to do is just, and I'm kind of moving at the same time. You know, I'm not poking and I'm always moving at the same time, but you can see the, how that's kind of folded in. By doing this just on the fabric, you're unfolding it and pushing it out so that that seam allowance is, you know, when you look close, you can see my stitches right there. You can see that thread and that's what I want. And so that means you've got that shape right there. And so then what I do is I bring it over here and um, a lot of times I'll just set it 
with this right here to kind of make sure coming from the inside out, you know, so that I'm not folding it back in or anything. Because what I like to do with my iron is really just press. Sometimes I'll press first and then I'll kind of go over it like that. And then I'll take these clappers and these are right of like clappers and I will just put them however I need to to get along that seam. And so these are made of wood and so the wood absorbs the heat and so it pulls the heat out of there faster. And because they, you know, weigh a little bit too, they're a little bit heavy, then um, they help your piece to um, cool off more quickly and to be flatter. Now I use this in piecing as well, which work very well, but I really like to use them in applique also. And that's all you need. That's what your shape should look like. So it's flat, but it's not like so flat you know, that you can't see those side seams at all. So that's how I like to have that piece. And so then I just go ahead and do the same thing with all of them. Maybe I'll show you how I do a circle. Circles are one of my favorite things to turn, but I know a lot of people say that um, they're afraid of the circles until they get experienced with them. And then they say, oh, they're my favorite too. But this is what I mean by a smaller piece. I literally will just put my thumb in there and just kind of use this motion, my finger, putting my thumb in, use my finger to just turn. And all I need is that turned like that to that point. And then this helps me just start pushing it out little by little. And at first it looks super crazy, which is why I know a lot of people are like, what, how is this ever going to look good? But you just, with a circle, do the same thing that I showed you before where you just gently turn and push at the same time. And I promise that it looks crazier on the back than it does in the front. Once you press this, you know, where there's a little bit more areas that you feel like you need to push out. You know, this is 100% cotton fabric. It does have a little bit of give. You can stretch it a little bit without poking through. Okay, just to get that shape correctly. And I, I like to make sure this is all folded flat before I come back over here. And again, this helps to kind of come from the inside out. And then I just press, put that on there for a few seconds. And I normally would probably leave it on there for probably 20 seconds, maybe 30, depending on how many, if this was a piece block, how many seams. But I just wanted to be able to show you. See, that's what that looks like. Okay. All right. I'm just going to continue um, shaping these, turning these pieces right here, how I showed you, and then... I've got my stack of background fabrics here. I've got them all cut for all 20 blocks. And then we're gonna go over to the work table and I'm gonna show you how I lay it all out. Okay, before I finish turning these, I just kind of wanted to show you, this is kind of what the flower, I'm kind of half starting to shape it, looks like. And so I just, I'm barely starting to push those petals out. If it's a larger flower, I would just use my fingers. But that's why I like this um, clover point-to-point -point turner because it's kind of a small, <laughs> narrow finger that gets in places that I can't. And then I just start shaping those petals just like I do a circle, just kind of with a curving motion. And I'm taking these two fingers and kind of squeezing it at the same time. Does that make sense? And setting that into place. You know how when you crease cotton, it kind of wants to stay there. It has a memory. Now, this is what it looks like from the front. And, you know, I clipped all the way there. So that's why these are um, going to be able to lie, you know, pretty flat. And what I do with this is I just do one petal at a time. And this is something. I didn't mean to flip that. This is something when this roller, and it's a flat one. It's not curved. It's flat, the seam roller. I like to get right in there and just push hard 
you know, a little hard. I mean, not super hard, but just to kind of set that. That's one that maybe I could have clipped like one thread farther because there's a little crease in it, but you can get it out by just doing that, okay? And then I go around and press this way just to get all those outside seams. And then I go ahead and press like that and put that clapper on and that will cool. Now, one thing I wanted to show you about this too is when I'm going into these points, I like to, let's show you in this way, I like to turn it sideways and use that seam allowance to kind of push, push that out. Do you need me to move, Cass? Can you see that's that good. against? Yeah. yeah. And kind of push that out. You can see that's that the turner is sideways like that, but the seam allowance is turned so that I can kind of push that seam allowance out and that brings it out, you know, kind of to a point. And I like that. So I had already pressed that and shaped that. And I know I've showed this so many times in a lot of my videos, but for those of you who may be new, I wanted to show you how I do those points and those curves. And so now that's what this, they're all ready to go. And now we'll go over to the work table and set up and I'll show you how to lay it out. Okay, here we are at the work table. And I just want to show you what I normally have when I'm laying out one of my uh, applique blocks. And for this quilt, since all the blocks are the same size, of course I have all of the backgrounds um, cut 12 inches. For this one, I pressed it in half so that I can center the strawberry. Some of the blocks will probably need to press it both ways to if it's a design like this. This one is just in half. This is a medium design board. It's 14 inches and so that's what I'll be using for that. I always have my 10 and a half inch trim it ruler because that's what I'll be using for um, when I'm trimming the block up. I always cut, so here's this one I have done. It's not appliqued yet, it's just glue based and ready to go. But so you can see that when you lay it on here and you center everything up on these pressed lines right here, you can see that this goes to the center that way. And when I go to trim it, I could either pull this down, see right here, this mark right here, make sure that that goes inside at the same time and that thing is exactly centered. And then I would just, after it's appliqued, I press from the back and then I just go ahead and trim with my rotary cutter on a, on a cutting mat, of course, and just trim it up and it's 10 and a half inches so that when you sew it into the quilt, it will finish at 10 inches. All of the blocks will. I like to cut my backgrounds a little bit bigger because if you are machine appliqueing or hand appliqueing or no matter what you're doing, or if you happen to have to do a little bit of embroidery, you know, you're gonna get some a little bit of distorting of the size of the background and you may get some frayed edges and things like that. So I always cut mine larger so that that is just not a worry for me. And then when it's done, I press it from the back again and trim it up. But I like to use this during layout to make sure that I'm not going past the lines that I need to go past. Meaning um, when you see this aqua line, and it says one quarter inch seam allowance. That's exactly what that is, is a quarter of an inch. As inside, because this is 10 and a half inch size, inside is 10 inches. And you can see what your block is gonna look like in the quilt inside this window of these quarter inch lines. You can see what that's gonna look like. So when you're trimming it, you can tell you're not gonna chop it off by trimming there, you know, things like that. Okay, this one has plenty of room. Some of them might be a little bit closer to the edge. So this is very important. Okay, so that's the sample. Again, I'm showing you that. So I've got my background. And then what I'm gonna do is just pull all the shapes in, kind of where they were, they were gonna go. Now this, because I know that it goes on the daisy, I might go ahead and just put that on here first. And so this is the glue by Sue Daly that I always use. I love it because it's repositionable if you need it to be repositionable, but if you don't, then you don't. But it, you can pull it off if you need to. And I just use a few dots like that. And let's just pull it over here so I can kind of eyeball it and see. And I'm just going to eyeball that and center it. I do always have my ruler 
so I can go around and measure that. I always have measuring tape. These are my new B Vintage measuring tapes. So I'm going to be using those, of course. And I always have my pins with my design board because a design board and pins in this process is just like a rotary cut cutter, mat, and ruler. Like, you can't use any of them without the other. And that's how I am with the glue, the pins, and the design board. This is, you know, that's the that's the magic triple combination that you need. Okay, so what I do is then I'm going to center my strawberry on that line, and that's really going to help me to see. Now, you can always come in from the outside and measure. That says two and a half that way, and that says just a little bit of a difference, so I'm going to adjust. Now, down here, let me see on the sample. It's about an inch and a half, and so that's what I'm going to do here. So just knock something off that I was going to show you here. Let me fix that. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do because I happen to have a sample. I don't need to figure that out. Then I'm going to lay that inch and a half inch wide ruler there. And put that at the top. And then at the top here, it's an inch and a half wide too. I try to make the measurements really easy and I try to tell you all the measurements if there may be some confusion. But because this is curved, I'm still kind of laying it over centered the best that I can. And it kind of ends up going, you know, sticking about a quarter of an inch past that crease right there. And so this is where I love the pins. Once I've get, you know, a few things in that I know where I want, then I can do that. And look, that's all I have to do with that. I know that's not going to move. Now I've got that glued, but first we've got to put the top on. And so with that, you're just going to see that this center point right here, you're just going to put it right to that point at the top of the strawberry. And then this one's going to go down the center of the strawberry. Okay. And then I just put a few pins in, kind of in the middle there. And before I pin this one down, I'm going to go ahead and glue this, all right? But before I glue it, and even though I have my pins in, you guys can see this top shot, I still like to lay my ruler then. This one's easy peasy, but I normally at this point will lay my ruler on and make sure that it is lined up. If it's something that has to be the same symmetrical in four corners, at this point I wouldn't put my pins in yet, I would lay the ruler on and adjust things and move things around as I need to, okay? And how I glue is, the reason I only put a couple of pins in here is so that I can adjust like this. And I can just start gluing. And just remember, a dot is a lot. This is a new bottle, so it's coming out kind of faster than normal, but I usually just use small dots in the place maybe that I would a pin. Pull that up. I still want that strawberry glued down on the edges, even though that's going to go over it. And I layer everything, and then either hand or machine applique. You know, I don't, I don't do a single layer, and then um, applique it, and then add the next layer. I just, I like to do the whole block how it goes, and then. You just don't need to applique all of the layers. And then I'll go ahead and add pins in the corners there. Now these are my pretty pins that are applique. And um, not the mini applique that have the little white tips to them, but these are multicolored. And let's see, let me pull those in. And that's on my uh, Flower Power magnetic pin holder. And I love that pin holder because you can see how the pins are upright. And I can just grab those pins out of there. And if one happens to flip upside down, all I have to do is turn it right side up again. And then, I can't remember if I got in there, but I like this little tip there. And then I just lift this up. I hope you can see with my hands being over the top of that. Okay, and now that that's all glued on the edges, I go ahead and just put pins going around so that, you know, I just make sure that it's to the back of the fabric, and that's why I use 
The design boards keeps the fabric from slipping and laying out nice and flat like my background, but then I can pin right to it. And I try not to poke through the other side, but if I do, I am usually on my ironing board surface or my sewing mat and it, you know, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't pick it up and rub my hands underneath. Now this flower right here, I can go ahead and kind of move these pins. And what I'm gonna do with that is you can place this to wherever you think, you know, looks nice. I like some of this leaf to poke out. I like some of that to poke out. Basically, you're not gonna be able to see that from the top. And so I just kind of turn it to where I think it looks nice. And it doesn't have to be exactly like, you know, the previous one. I kind of like that. And then I'll just put a couple pins, since the circle's already pinned on, I'll just put a couple pins there so that I can go ahead and put like three little dots of glue on each petal. I try to stay a quarter of an inch away from the edge because I don't wanna to have to needle through my glue or the sewing machine to have to go through my glue. Now it can, it's pretty easy to go through it, but I just don't want it to have to. And this is water soluble, so if you get something, you know, I can just wash my hands and that won't be a problem. Now, um, like I say, this is a pretty simple block, but just to let you know, if you're doing something a little bit more complicated and you get to this point and you've got everything pinned down, and I usually let it sit for 10, you know, 15 minutes or whatever, just enough to kind of dry it in, and you pull everything out and you look at it, and you wish that you would have moved something over, you can, you can pull up this glue. You just have to peel it up and you can reposition it. And that's what I like about that. Um, a question that I've been asked before too was why is my interfacing not fusible? Well, that just doesn't work for my shapes because I press my shapes and shape them before I even layer them. And so if it was fusible, you would only have an opportunity to press it once onto the background. And you know, that's just not what I wanna do. I want to be able to have control of my shapes and have them already turned so that I can see exactly what this is going to look like, which is why I came up with the shapes in the first place so that I wanted applique that was already, you know, you could see the exact finished size of each piece when you went to lay it out. And that saves a lot of problems and a lot of hassle. And um, also they're very easy to sew, as you can see how easy it was. This is from the next block to just simply trace it and put it on there and there's no, you know, fiddling with the seam allowances after that. You simply just sew them and turn them. Okay, so that's why my interfacing is not fusible and that's where this soup glue comes in, okay? And so that takes the place of that, and I like to be able to change things around if I need to. Okay, so I'm just gonna let that dry for a minute, and then I'll go ahead and applique it like this one. Now, let's talk about applique. I will link to my video that I've shown you, my hand applique and my machine applique, and I've talked about that in my Be Prepared post as well. But what I do is use matching thread with the applique, not the background, if you're doing machine applique, you don't need to match the bobbin thread. You can just leave your normal bobbin thread in the bottom. It's just the top that you would want to applique with. And then usually I just do a bunch of blocks at the same time and keep like, for instance, my green thread in and do all the green at the same time, then all the pink at the same time, then all the yellow, you know, and it's pretty easy. You can do an edge stitch applique, which is just almost like top stitching, or you can do a tiny little zigzag. Okay, and hand applique is just the regular needle turn applique stitch, but you don't have to turn, turn the seams under with your needle, they're already turned, so you still do the same stitch. But I will link that video here again so that you can watch that if you'd like. And then I've told you once it's applique, again, press it from the back, take your ruler and trim it. All of the blocks in this quilt are trimmed with the 10 and a half inch trim it ruler because they all finish at 10 inches. So let's pull this quilt back in here. And, um, oh, one of the things I forgot to 
tell you is I usually, I will tell you in each tutorial too, so I wanna go ahead and tell you this, the height and width of each applique piece. So that's why I always have my tape measures too. It's easy to do that. So this is nine inches. Okay, and then this, of course, is just only as wide as the applique piece itself, which is seven. But because you know this is nine inches, you're gonna have, um, and it finishes at 10, you're gonna have a half inch of background showing on each end, okay? And, all right, here's the quilt. And I've talked to you already about the guide. Okay, and we're going to be doing each block, not in order, but just kind of, I started out with um, the strawberry and I told you why I did that. And then I started to kind of continue on <laughs> with some of the fruits and things like that and do some of the simplest ones first. And I, I hate to say when we get to the end, it's the harder blocks, because I don't think they're harder. They just take longer because they're more pieces. And so, but here's the schedule right here. Now, I will start on July 10th, like I just said, this starts. This video will be out a few days before July 10th, just because I like to do that so I can link to it and things like that in my blog post. So just go to my Be In My Bonnet blog, uh, just, just Google Be In My Bonnet and it'll come right up, or just use the link that I've provided here in this video to go to my blog. There is always a link to my blog in every video that I do. You just have to look at the drop down menu, click on it, and so that you can see all of the links and all the information about this video that I've given to you. Then two days later on Wednesday, I'll be doing the Vintage Apple. Okay, and that's down here. I'll be doing the Vintage Cherries on Friday. And then I'll start over the next week. So I'll always be doing Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And it just tells you, okay, as, I, as you go along, that's the schedule. That doesn't mean the schedule you have to follow. That's just the schedule of when I'm doing the tutorials so that you can tune in any time that you want and look at that block. Within each post, I will have a link to every block that I have done so far. So as we go along, by the time we get to the big finish, the very last block, there will be a link and a picture of every block in this quilt because I will have already done it. And so that you can easily click on those so that you're not, you know, you don't feel lost. I do have links to my sew along, my past sew alongs and things like that on my sidebar, on the right sidebar of my blog when you pull it up. There's just a lot of them and sometimes it takes a long time to load, but if you're on my blog long enough, pretty soon you'll see them pop up. And so, you know, there's links to like the quilt that you saw that's hanging on the wall right now in my sewing room behind me. Um, that's still on my blog. That is my So Simple Shapes series that I did with all of my So Simple Shapes up until Autumn Love. And, um, you know, that still remains on my blog. And you can see those on the side, links to that to the side of my blog. All right, so that's about my blog. About the blocks of the quilt and the guide, of course, I'll leave a link to the guide here. Plus it's in my blog. Um, blocks i just pulled out a few i have all of my blocks cut because i have the guide and it's showing me each piece to cut that doesn't mean you have to have yours cut i just like you to be prepared as you want to be and so this is how i am prepared here's the apple block that i'm going to be doing see i've already got everything cut and ready on a design board and traced okay so there's my apple the next one will be the vintage cherries so I've got that ready to go. And this is the butterfly. And so that's ready to go. This is the vintage butterfly. I've got both wings here, traced and ready to go. And here's the bottom tail. Now, you may say, well, that looks like a mermaid fin. Well, sometimes when I do a shape, when I can see that it sort of looks like something and it's just going to be tucked, this part's gonna be tucked underneath, then I go ahead and shape it like that because guess what? Maybe you do want to do a mermaid tail in another block. So I kind of like to make my shapes versatile if I can. So there's the vintage maple leaf ready to go. That's two pieces. That's gonna be easy peasy. <laughs> and this one's gonna be quick as well. This is the Scotty dog. And so that's just an example of how I have mine ready to go and I have them stacked. This is just the first six. I don't wanna pull them all in, but I have them all cut and ready to go. And I just use my 
10 inch squares of interfacing. You can use the yardage that's in the package too. It's the exact same interfacing. This is just handy because these are large enough to use for all of these pieces. And I cut all of my backgrounds like I showed you ahead of time. And so they're ready to go. Now, another thing that might come in handy is you might want to copy another just of this image off of the same page that the Sew Along Guide is on when I give you the link. And you can do another copy of the quilt and then you can cut up the blocks and you could put um, like, because this is the vintage Scotty dog, that picture I would just, you know, put on the design board with it or pin it to it and then you know that's what that is to keep it organized, things like that. Okay, that's another tip. And then the final thing that I wanted to tell you about is this is the sampler quilt, but each block would make a really cute quilt on its own, meaning using the same block over and over again. Or you could just take the fruit ones if you wanted and make a fruit quilt, you know. Or you could take, you know, the butterflies and the teapots. That would be really cute to do alternate blocks like that. There's several things that you could do. But um, in my, in my um, storyboards, in my virtual markets, I have shown you when I have designed these and with just my basics fabrics. So this is the vintage strawberries, what it would look like in all one quilt. And this is done out of my basics collections. Okay, and so I just wanted to show you that first off because, um, you know, because we're talking about the strawberry block. But in my B. storyboard, I colored more quilts and in case you didn't see my virtual market, I wanted to show you that what we do is we put this on here for the quilt shops to see this, and then we put the fabric requirements and all the SKUs, meaning exact fabric used in here. And so the quilt shops can cut kits for you, and many quilt shops are. So just Google vintage strawberries, you know, be vintage strawberries, whatever you want by Lori Holt, and see which quilt shops are offering these kits and you'll be sure to find one. But you can also go and look on the storyboard itself on Riley Blake's website, and I will link my B Dots storyboard, and you can see yourself to see if you have these fabrics. You Then you'll know the SKU, and you can see the pictures. So there's the strawberry, and then right here is a vintage applique that you can see that's the applique block here, but you do it in different coordinating colors. These are from um, my B Dots collection. And then I also did the vintage flower baskets in this one. And I'm just simply showing you coloring and what you can do with this. You can change things up if you want, but I'm just giving you ideas. And, you know, the quilt shops ask for that so that they can, you know, get kits cut for you and things like that because you guys are always requesting kits from them. And I think that's a great thing. And so here is the vintage teapots and what they could look like in one quilt together. Now, when I did be vintage, when I did this fabric collection, which is what this quilt is all going to be made from, then I not only did the sampler quilt, but I did six other quilts as well. So here's the butterfly. Here's the apple. Here's Sunbonnet Sue. There's the vintage dahlias. And there's maple leaves and here's the Scotty dogs. Now I hope that you're noticing the same theme in the quilt that all the finishing meaning all of the cutting and the finishing is exactly the same for the sashings and borders it's just different fabric popped in so that makes it really super easy and in the sew along guide is all of the measurements for that for the borders and the sashings and instructions for that all you need to worry about is what blocks you want to pop in. And just because, you know, I have this fabric in the border, maybe you want orange in yours. So you can do orange. You don't have to do, this is just samples that I'm giving you using a variety of these prints. And I um, had a lot of people request for the Sunbonnet Sioux to be bordered in lavender. But if you're not a lavender person, then do it in a different color. Do it in aquas, do it in yellows or something like that. So, you know, you're the boss of your own quilt. That's what I always like to say. 
and you know who you're making the quilt for and you want to make them happy. And so, you know, always be the boss of your own quilt and change things up if you have to. All right, so that's the strawberry block. I hope that I've told you everything that I need to let you know about the sew along. If I've missed something, again, it's all detailed on my blog, all of the notions, everything talking about everything that we need and everything that we're gonna do. Thank you so much for joining me in my sewing room today. And I'm so happy to have you here. And it's always fun to have you here to help me, you know, as I'm sewing and chatting with you. And it, it is a big help to me and because I love doing it. Uh, quilting is such a social thing for me. And I hope it is the same for you too. And I love that we can do it online together worldwide from all over the world. And we don't have to be sitting next to each other, but we can feel like we're sitting next to each other. And that's what I try to bring you for my channel is to make it feel like that I'm sitting with you right in your sewing room or you're sitting with me in my sewing room. And so thank you again so much for your support of me, my designs and my channel. And thanks for joining me on this sew along. I really think it's going to be another fun quilt to make and I'll chat with you later.